Does he go around people dust. with a microphone abusing people? Dust. Is that what Jesus does? Going around, being dust. abusive, being bothered to destroy it. The key question I've asked is, all of them, why would a merciful, just God create hell? And I think Christianity does an excellent job of addressing how to live, for the most part. I think other religions do that to some extent as well, and we should embrace them all as much as possible. Christianity teaches that God is love. Islam teaches that God is power, will. And that's why the highest value in the Islamic moral system is dominion. Ali Dawa believes in killing apostates, and he's... Can you buy at least into that even though you don't agree with the, with the opinion? It's not a crazy idea to question the notion of a merciful God who's omnipotent and omnipresent. Damn it. Oh, really? Yeah. So, yeah. so, so. Just get him on it because we won't get to do this again. In, 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 interest, in interest to your, your point. So, firstly, we've got to understand why Christians believe in hell. We believe in hell because the apostles and the prophets teach hell. And so, for a Christian, there can be no debate or discussion about whether hell exists. Um, and for a Christian, there can be no compromise on whether heaven or hell exists. The question, really, I would put back to you is whether you truly believe in the prophets and the apostles. Because if they teach, if they teach that heaven and hell exists, then, then the discussion can't even begin. Now, whether, whether, we, whether we can say that heaven and hell is just, well, obviously I as a Christian believe that hell is just. Okay, what I asked you was, can you empathize with no. someone on your car? I, I mean, I, I can understand Thank your you, reasons, I but I don't, I, I don't agree in okay, I'm not asking slightly. You, uh, obviously we don't agree, but yeah. you can understand. I'm not coming to you with a, it seems to me compatible with the Sermon on the Mount and stuff, which I take to be core Christian. Incompatible. Teaching. No, compatible, incompatible. The idea of love thy neighbor as thyself, yeah, love thy enemy, um, the golden rule, etc. That all, everything in particular in Christianity seems to speak to a loving, merciful, just God. And the notion of a God who is uh, omnipotent and omniscient, who understands the consequences of his creation before he even creates it, and will punish people disproportionately. God, with respect to you, I, I'm, I'm having a more general philosophical debate, and I don't feel obliged to take anything in any given book, literally, anyway. Yeah? So I'm sure you've got text which will counter what I'm saying, but I'm trying to broaden it into a more general philosophical debate. These themes are common to Islam, there are concerns to atheists as well. I think your point with Steve about objective morality is very important, and this is where religion's got good ground. Religion is, not just Christianity, trying to adhere to some form of objective moral code, and I'm hopeful that's out there. So if we can chat on that basis, I'd like that. If, it, if we cannot just do a, you know, a, a chat to a talk to camera where you talk from the Bible, because then it's a one-way discussion. So in, in terms of, you, you appealed to, and, and, and quite tactically so, but then you, you, you appealed to the Sermon on the Mount. But then when I pulled out my Bible, suddenly you didn't want the Bible Apologies. to be read. Apologies. So Christ, Christ, Christ who taught, you brought the Sermon on the Mount. No, so now you've introduced the Bible, I'm going to use the Bible. So Christ himself says, Christ himself says that, that, that the lake of burning, says fear not man who can destroy the body, but fear God whom having destroyed the body can also destroy the soul. Christ talks about that the flames of hell, the, the lake of sulfur and fire, these are Christ's own words, the lake of, uh, of burning sulfur and fire that, that consumes, that licks I'm sure those words are continuously. In glad, I'm glad that I, I, I haven't found the passage just yet. Accurate. So one second, if we're going to do interruptions, I'll start interrupting okay, you. Okay. So. What we've got is that you appeal to the Sermon of the Mount and not, say, not the, and you, okay, right, I'm going to start int interrupting you from now on. So you appeal to the Sermon of the Mount and the Sermon of the Mount was given by the same teacher who talks about hell. So it isn't that Christ or that the biblical teaching is in conflict. It is that you're biblically ignorant about the one who gives the Sermon on the Mount. Because the one who gives the Sermon on the Mount taught and believed in hell, which means that Christians must teach and believe in hell. 
So before you try to misquote the Bible any further, you must understand that we Christians take everything that the Bible says, and we don't pick and choose the bits that we want to use and then ignore the rest. I consider myself a Christian of sorts. Okay. Christian of sorts don't exist. Okay, according to you, they don't. According to me, I happen to feel that way. Maybe I'm on, on what authority? On, I do any, on the authority of my own judgment and my own soul. Okay? I happen to think that, for example, you and Kay, these with soccer films, I believe you disagree on evolution. I think Kay doesn't believe in evolution, Darwinian. I believe that you have the good sense to believe in Darwinian evolution. Yeah? Now, you would both self-proclaim you were Christians. I don't think either of you are lying. I think both of you consider yourself Christians, and to a fair extent you are. But nonetheless, there's a disparity on a, a, a core principle, and that's not the end of the discussion. So you and I will also have disparities on core issues. It doesn't mean I can't see myself as having some sympathy. Except, except that evolution is not a core issue. Well, I, I think it's fairly pivotal in No, I'm sorry, but once again, you demonstrate your ignorance of the Christian faith. Rude. You don't have to you're demonstrating your ignorance of the Christian faith because the Christian faith has defined its core issues down through the centuries at the councils. And the, 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 the core issues of our faith are defined by the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, and those that do not adhere to that creed are outside of the faith. So let me ask you this question. Do you believe in the Trinity? I'm sorry, we've shifted tack. Because you are claiming to be a Christian. I'm interested in... I'm interested we'll come... In, you're no, you're no, saying no, you're no, a Christian you're gonna, of sorts. You're going to move ah, into the okay. branches. I'm interested I promise, in once, you, once you affirm or deny your belief in the, in the, you know, the Nissing Constantinopolitan oh, Creed... No, I, don't I don't take a council of people who discussed a book several hundred years ago to be definitively the truth beyond any question. No. So you don't believe in the Trinity? No, I, I, no, I didn't say that. Do you believe I, in the Trinity? I think the Trinity as a metaphor works pretty well. Trinity as a metaphor, not as a reality? Um, I think it's a maybe, but more likely... As a maybe. So you're not a Christian, bro? According to you. According to the church. Silly delusional me. You're not a Christian. Brain. You're not a Christian, bro. Couldn't possibly have any real empathy with Christianity. The modernistic approach is the right. Way. Okay. Let, let I want to do the core discussion. Okay. You can't emphasize with the idea of health. I'm looking. Okay. At core, it's this. I scan reality looking for self consistency. Okay. It's a yeah. reasonable premise. Yeah. If an argument is self consistent intellectually and morally and objectively, it yeah. leads to multivariance. I'm more likely to go with it, okay? So I look at the story I'm told about Christianity, and I'm told I have a merciful, loving, um, just God, and I'm told something similar in Islam, who is omnipotent and omniscient, and created the universe, and with foresight decided to create hell, knowing in advance that in the act of creating fallible human beings, he would definitely be condemning them to infinite suffering for finite transgressions. And this is the core point, okay? Infinite punishment for a finite transgression is disproportionate and seems unfair and, in, and inconsistent with the other principles that come through in Christianity. And when Christians, people who set call themselves Christians, I believe you think you are, emphasize the hell aspect above what seems to be the core Sermon on the Mount type aspect of the Golden Rule, which is also common to a lot of other religions and atheists can get on board with, it's a bit depressing. Okay, okay so let me let me reply to because you, you said a lot there. Thank you. Firstly, firstly, I don't judge truth by whether I, 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 it, making me, it makes me depressed or not. I judge truth by whether it is true, by whether it is grounded in the right authority. And, and you have given this idea of a, a, um, a coherent worldview. And you have borrowed a worldview of your own choosing based upon yourself as the authority. So you've taken the idea of a, a just God, a merciful God, um, a God of compassion, which are all sort of nods towards the Christian worldview, but you don't believe in the book that teaches it, because the book that teaches it also teaches hell. You don't believe in the church that preserved those beliefs, because the church has defined its core doctrines in the councils, and you've rejected those. And so your own worldview is not coherent. You're picking and choosing based upon your subjective feelings and opinions. Now, furthermore, furthermore, you have assumed something that I disagree with, that hell is not just. And I would say that hell is just because every punishment should fit the crime. And to insult the honor of God is to insult that value in the cosmos that is of the infinite worth and value. The honor of God is beyond reproach. It is second to nothing. Such is the honor of God that he gives a commandment that you should not take his name in vain. If you cannot even take the name of God in vain, 
What more against the, 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 all of his qualities, all of his mercy, all of his compassion? And so when he offers mercy freely through Christ, who you do not accept his teaching, because Christ teaches, because Christ teaches hell and you don't believe in hell, do, 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 you, do, you, do you believe that hell is real? No, I think it's metaphorical. Did Christ teach hell was real? It's in a book. So Christ taught that hell was real and you don't believe what Christ taught. I don't think your book may be absolutely So how do you know what Christ taught then? I don't know. Right, so here we go. He's someone who's claiming to be a Christian. He's claiming to borrow, he's borrowing from a Christian worldview, but he doesn't even have any certainty upon that which he's drawing this do, from. Yeah, do, do. He doesn't, do, he doesn't, do, right, I'm just going to start speaking up because you're interrupting I'm constant, up constantly. So, the reality is he, he has an inconsistent worldview that, that, that he condemns because he condemned an inconsistent worldview. Remember at the beginning of the conversation? Because he said, I'm looking for a coherent worldview, but his own worldview is inconsistent. Because he says, I'm a Christian, but he doesn't believe in the book. He do, he's not sure about it. He doesn't believe in the church councils because he doesn't believe in those. And so what we're really getting to is that this brother, you're, you're picking and choosing what you want from based upon your own feelings, not based upon any authority other than yourself. Now, Christ, no, Christ, yeah, yeah, you can reply. Yes, 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 yes. Christ himself taught hell exists. That is a fact to the Bible, and I'm going to find the passage that shows that, because I want you to deal with it. I want you to deal with Christ, the fact that he teaches with hell. I want you to deal with that and square it with your claim to be a Christian. That's what, what, you, what I want to do. No, 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 one second, one second, because you've been cutting in continuously, so I'm just not going to be shutting up until you stop talking and let me talk. Right. Now the 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 the, qu the point is the point is the honor of God the honor of God is infinite the punishment should fit the crime if you if you insult the honor of God then the punishment has to be worthy of the crime if we can't even insult the name of God what more to the rest of his dignity and if God offers you a gift and you slap it aside and say I don't want your mercy then you deserve a punishment for that insult so how would you reply to that Two points, I, I, I mean. would reply that A, you've totally misrepresented my position, B, you've overstated and restated the self the same, no offence, platitude again and again. We all know this stuff. This is all taken as rest. I'm trying to get to the roots of the thing, okay? Now, I have a lot of sympathy with your position. The root of the thing is Jesus. Okay, your argument, pre your argument predicates on the fact that the literal truth is in that book. One thing that's very interesting to me is the Muslims will argue the same thing. And Christians don't interpret the Bible completely. Ah, but, but I said I would interrupt you from now on because you've been interrupting me continuously. The camera will show the amount of air time we've had relative to each other and then you can jump. And it will also show how many times you interrupted. Okay, but I'm interrupting on bad Would you like to do this time? Shall, shall we do this time? Time might be good. Let's do this time. Okay, Can we get a timer? Okay. Time or just point it? Just like timer, timer, timer. I agree, but he has interrupted continuously and you're my witness. Has he not been interrupting me? Thank you very much. So you can't complain if you're interrupted. So now let's do it timed. Let's do it timed. Three minutes each. So three minutes for you. I've been prepared for a time debate. I'm trying to have a constructive debate with Muslims. I've done Ali Dawar on this point. I've done K. Bro, you control the mic. Katu, Sam Katu. Hold the mic, sir, so you can have... Hold the mic, sir. Oh, thank you. So, I'm... Hello. Sorry, I'm in the middle, literally in the middle. I'm trying to get a... No, keep it going. Okay, I'm trying to get a constructive debate on the topic of hell for the minute. My interest is in morality. Um, I have empathy and sympathy with numerous religions, including Christianity. Most atheists think that I'm... A crit, some kind of spiritualist. Most spiritualists seem to think I'm an atheist. I'm walking a fine line. The key question I've asked is, all of them, why would a merciful, just God create hell? If he is, or she, or whatever, is omnipotent and omniscient um, and omnipresent, with, can see the future and knows exactly what they're doing, why in advance would they choose to create fallible human beings who they know are going to make mistakes and then go, that's the rules of the game I'm going to pick anyway? and then those people get punished infinitely for making finite mistakes even though they were constructed to be fallible. Yeah? 
Now it seems inconsistent. Bob says that I'm not coming from any consistent point of view. I've already said on tape very clearly, I'm judging reality based on self-consistency. If something is consistent within its own discipline and it's consistent with other disciplines such as science, it gains more and more credibility. And I see a moral inconsistency within the text of Christianity and Islam, which I don't think totally damns either of those religions, they both have some merit, but there seems to be a moral inconsistency with a loving, just, merciful God creating hell. At the centre of the Bible, and particularly the New Testament, I see a God essentially of compassion and love who thinks we are all equal and should be treated equally and places human decisions at the moral centre of each life. So when Bob says, who are you to choose this? I'm doing what God necessitates I do. I'm making a moral choice myself about how to view the world and I'm hoping I do the best, yeah? And I've been created fallible and I may get it wrong. I'm hoping to get it right but I'm looking for as much common ground as possible. And what I have liked from what I heard Bob say in the previous debate, sorry, how long have I got? What I have liked, which I think is pivotal to this discussion, is uh, something called the Euthyphro Dilemma, which is in Plato, it's in the Platonic Dialogues. And Bob said earlier that nature itself points to the good. Yeah? Um, I believe you did say that. Can I check you on that? Yeah? I concur with that. Yeah? And this is what was discussed in the Euthyphro Dilemma, where Plato, the question address was, does God order it because it's good, or is it good because God orders it? Yeah? This is really important. You believe one of two things. I believe it's not, I believe um, God orders it because it's good. In other words, there are laws of nature in place, and God is trying to guide us to walk them the best way. Yeah? If you believe that, a whole load of ideas will naturally follow. If you believe the opposite, that it's good because God commands it, which is a more fundamentalist position, then you're going to end up believing, well, if God decides it's good to, okay to murder, that's okay, and you'll just be slavish. So it's a rock and a hard place which one you accept, but you've got to accept to one or the other. And I'm hoping we combine and agree that it's good, God, time, God says it because it's good. Time. time. Thank you very much. Okay. JC, where's he gone? He's just gone. All right. Well, my time started. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, go. So, the, my, my first objection, my very first objection, is to the incoherence of the questioner's worldview. Because if you start with a premise that for a worldview to be believable, it has to be coherent, it's incumbent upon you to have a coherent worldview. To claim that you're a Christian, but not actually follow the Jesus of the New Testament, means simply that your worldview is incoherent. Now, we have the brother on camera, he's not gonna deny it, he doesn't believe what the Bible teaches, he doesn't believe what the Bible says about Jesus, and he doesn't believe about the Council of Nicaea. Which means that, by every definition, he's not a Christian. So my first objection is that the person saying Christianity, the Bible has an incoherent worldview, is himself guilty of having an incoherent worldview. My second reply is that Jesus is clear. Hell exists. Eternal punishment exists. Christ said in Matthew 25, verse 46, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, and these will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, ladies and gentlemen, does he believe in Jesus or not? Does he believe Jesus' teachings or not? If he says that he believes in Jesus and his teachings, then he should believe what Jesus says. If he doesn't believe in Jesus' teachings, then he should stop calling himself a Christian, because that is the very definition of being a Christian. Now, why is eternal punishment coherent? Because punishments must fit the crime. And the crime that sends people to hell is that they reject the mercy of God. God has offered mercy freely to you, to me, to you, Dawood. He's not asked anything in return. All you do is you accept it. It's already in your back pocket. It's in your back pocket, Dawood. Jesus did it, it's in, you've got the check, but you haven't cashed it. Christians have cashed the check of that forgiveness. And this act of mercy is out of the honor of God, the mercy of God, the love of God. He's given it freely. God has said that his honor is irreproachable and of infinite value. So much so that one of the Ten Commandments says that you should not insult the name of God. It breaks one of the Ten Commandments. 
Well, if you insult the honour of God, you've committed a crime of infinite value. So the punishment must match the crime and also be eternal. That is coherent. Yeah. Um, I'd say on that then, if God believes, thank you, yeah. If, if Bob's honest reaction is he thinks that hell is a proportional response to that offence, we've just got a different moral compass, yeah? yeah? I think my moral compass is closer to the spirit of what's in his book. He thinks that it's not. You'll have to decide as a viewer which way we should go on this, yeah? Um, one thing I will say is that Bob has had the good sense in the past, I've seen him debating, to admit that he doesn't take everything in the Bible literally. Yeah? He, he has, he'll see some of it as metaphorical and he'll interpret from different angles. For example, he believes in evolution. There are dozen Christians who don't. I mentioned Kay before. She doesn't, but I consider them both Christians. But on what I consider to be a pivotal point, they disagree, namely evolution. Bob has argued evolution isn't pivotal. I think it fundamentally is if you look at the book of Genesis and you want to discuss seven day creation and a whole load of things. Now, again, if Bob wants to shake his head, he can. But as a viewer, hopefully, you can see that whether you believe in Darwinian evolution or not is a fundamental point because religion seems to be at odds with science. And as I said to Bob, I'm looking for self-consistency. I think the way we live in our lives day to day, we feel self-consistency in each other, in the institutions we interact with. It's a good and healthy instinct you should pursue it. What I get from religion is, the truth is good, pursue the truth. But my best path to truth seems to be self-consistency. Yeah? Bob says I don't have a coherent worldview. No, he's right. I'm a pilgrim. No, thank you, mark that one up. I'm not. I don't say I have a coherent worldview. What I do say is, I aspire to a coherent worldview. My understanding of truth is a work in progress. I think the Bible is an excellent book, as arguably is the Quran and other books, to help us move towards truth. So I'm looking at a model of truth which says we're not holding the truth in our hands, the truth is over there, and religions and other books are vehicles to get us there, and each of those vehicles, has they're not all equal, I'm not saying all religions are equal to preempt something I think you'll say, each of those vehicles has certain strengths and weaknesses. I think Christianity, pound for pound, may be the best religion going, personally. But it doesn't mean that I'm alienated from other religions. I think there can be value in multiple vehicles. And I don't think any of them should have the arrogance, actually, to think you hold the truth in your hand. Because we're fallible, we need some humility, and we move towards truth. So I don't believe in this literalist interpretation. And what's interesting to me is, when you debate Muslims, you're very attuned to the fact that they take their Quran textually, literally, to the last syllable. And I've seen you consistently win arguments to your credit with them because you understand the limitations of that level of literalism. What to me is a bit tragic is to see Christians not sit, look at the moat in their own eye to quote, quite, to quote, quote Christ and understand that maybe we shouldn't take our books quite so literally as well. I don't doubt those words are written in that book, but as you're aware, I don't accept that your interpretation or even the facts of that book are automatically to be taken as read if they contradict the self-consistency morally and objectively that I'm seeking from a worldview. Thank you. Okay, ready? Go. So this is the kind of conversation that I like, and I really appreciate your arguments. Thank you. I really do. And I like this kind of conversation because this is the kind of conversation that should be happening at Speaker's Corner, not yes. shouting matches. Yes, yeah. And I just wish Muslims would learn to have conversations in the corner, not shouting matches. So, in, in terms of what this brother said, he's, he's admitted something, and I applaud your honesty, integrity, he doesn't have a consistent worldview. Well, when you have a consistent worldview, come back and make a criticism then. Because in five years' time, you might find you're agreeing with me completely. The point of the matter is that right at this second, your own position is fluid. Your own position is changeable. Your own position is something that you yourself will admit you might not hold in 10 years time. And so your critique of the Christian worldview can be dismissed from the point of view that it is itself inconsistent and incongruent to a, uh, a well-formed critique. Now he's reduced the Bible to the spirit of what it means. Well, the reality is that who's deciding that? Himself, based on his own opinion. That's not how Christianity works. Christianity is not a democracy. Christianity is built upon revelation. And Christ himself states that if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with you one eye than have two eyes and to be thrown into hell 
where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to be clear. I chose that verse precisely because I don't take it literally. Jesus does not literally tell you to cut off your hands and your feet. He doesn't literally tell you to rip out your eyes. And when he talks about hell, this, this concept of hell, I have a minority view within the Christian worldview. I believe that the fires of hell are eternal. I believe that the demons, the beast and the dragon will burn eternally in hell. But I believe that the souls of sinners will be burned up in hell and cease to exist. Now, how is that reconciled to the idea of an eternal punishment of the verse that I quoted earlier? Because once you cease to exist, you can no longer benefit or profit. And the reason why you cease to exist is because you have been burnt up in hell. Your punishment is eternal. There's no coming back from it. Now, the scriptures talk about being destroyed, that God, that Christ can destroy the soul. So hell, I believe, is consistent. The soul, I do not believe, burns in hell eternally. Oh, hang on, that's important. Sorry, I didn't understand. But so, if you want more time on that point... Do you I want me to clarify? I, the, how, long, how long do you want to give me? I, give, give me 10 seconds, 20 seconds to clarify my question. We can go back to okay. you. My core objection was that infinite punishment for a finite transgression seemed not just or merciful, it's therefore incompatible. If you don't believe in infinite hell, I've got to rethink my position with regard to the discussion. So, sorry, what's your position? Do you believe you suffer in hell infinitely or not? Okay, so, I want to be clear. No. My position is a minority view amongst Christians. Yeah. Most Christians do not hold my position. Okay. And the fact that they hold a different position, i.e. eternal, infinite punishment, yeah. I accept as a Christian as being not only the majority view, mm -hmm. Not only the traditional view, uh -huh. but also the, 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 the view that is classical. Uh -huh. But I as a Christian have been convinced, and I am open to correction on this, that the Bible teaches that if a sinner, let's imagine you, just as a hypothetical statement. Let's imagine that you, you, you reject God's grace and you go to hell a sinner. May yeah. Allah protect you. Yeah, yeah, uh, you beat me to it. Yeah, God, by God willing that won't happen. But if you go to hell, I believe that hell will burn up your soul and you will cease to exist. Okay. So that, 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 uh, what, what makes it infinite, what makes it eternal, is that the consequence of your soul not existing yeah. is eternal. So it is an eternal Again, event. That's an important distinction. But you have reached that point of non-existence because you were burnt up in hell. Right. That's my position. Thank you. Um, in response, um, can I quickly respond to that and then have to Yeah, give me two minutes. In response to that, good. I misunderstood Bob's position. It's less draconian than I thought. Infinite torture is worse than simple non-existence, yeah? And I think the idea of non-existence seems a bit more cogent and a bit more in tune. Still doesn't go quite far enough, but actually it might break the back of my objection and I'll have to think about that more deeply, yeah? Okay. Okay. So, so, so oh, sorry, yeah, go on, okay. go on. So yeah. look at the other things that you mentioned. Um, but when you were on the bandwagon for hell for a minute, I personally would be offended if my friend Dawood, who is standing here, who happens to be on Ali Dawa's team, who Bob has debated before and who I know to be a guy of excellent character, superbly well read, honest, humble, better guy than me, I would say. Seriously. Um, the idea that a god would condemn him to hell simply because in the pub quiz of which religion to pick he made the wrong intellectual choice. If that's the nature of God, I think I'll reject that God anyway. Alright? Be he God or not, because that's just bad behaviour as far as I'm concerned. You said that my behaviour is fluid, and I'd say that's what it is to be a pilgrim. I, I think not knowing is part of the deal, yeah? Um, and I've seen that criticism be made of science. I've seen you talk about science before with uh, Mohammed Hijab, and you both say, yes, yeah, science changes. And I think that's a bit disingenuous because, yes, science changes, but what science does in its methodology is improve, I would argue. It's fluid, yeah? It's fluid, and you'd take that as a criticism, but a mode of thinking which says, I'm going to be fluid and I'm going to try and move towards truth. It means you improve. And the history of science shows a methodology which has taken two steps forward and one step back, maybe, but has broadly improved by being fluid. So what's important to me, again, is not that I'm holding the truth in my hand, because I don't think I ever will. I think if there's a God, he's ultimately mystical and beyond my understanding. What's important is that I'm heading in the right direction. Morality is like a compass, yeah? You want to head due north towards the light. So the, the, in the foundation, I suppose I'll go a bit deeper here, I have to... 
In the foundation of both of these religions is the idea of binary choices. It's either right or wrong, good or bad. And I think if you shift onto a spectrum which is instead Mormonistic, which goes, the truth is this way, north is this way, now how far off course are you? Just because you're heading northwest doesn't mean you're wrong. You're still doing better than if you're heading north-northwest or east or something, yeah? So it's relative. You want to aspire to, like, it's like trying to draw a perfect circle. You'll never draw a perfect circle, but your aspiration to do so is what's correct. And that's the guide, and I'll never hold the absolute truth. So to condemn me for being fluid, I have to make choices. That's the moral dilemma of being a human being. I'm trying to make the best ones I can. I'm looking for self-consistency, and I do believe in a God of love and mercy and justice. So I'm hoping, hoping that maybe you've interpreted your book over draconianly, although I like what you last said um, about hell. I, that feels like moving towards common ground. Okay, ready when you are. I'll say, okay, so, oh, so the, the, the point that I would want to make to you is that Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father except through me. Christ himself said, he asked his disciples and he said, whom do you say that I am? And Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Christ said that flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So if you want, I, I'm telling you, pilgrim, that if you want to be grounded on the truth, if you want to head true north, you've got to head to Jesus. And without heading to Jesus, you're going to be off because he's your north star. He's your guiding light. He is the light of the world. He is the one who brings he um, the, 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 the bread of life down from heaven. He is that bread of life. He, those that feed on him have eternal life. That is where you've got to ground yourself. You've got to walk in Jesus' way. I'm not calling you to join a particular church. I'm calling you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and to take him seriously. Now, I, you, you've misunderstood my view of the scientific method. I don't dismiss science with glib comments like, oh, science changes. I, I, I actually accept science whole and complete. The scientific methodology is sound and it has demonstrated itself sound demonstrably through countless achievements. And anyone who's got a problem with that, just as to ask, will they trust science the next time they need an MRA scan? Or why are they using their mobile phone? The, the, so I don't dismiss science. Christians, don't, Christians who know the Christian worldview don't see a conflict between the scientific worldview and the Christian worldview. Now I want to show you why I believe that Jesus doesn't teach the idea of eternal punishment. This is what, this is what Jesus said, look. Do not fear those who will kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body, soul and body in hell. So hell teaches the destruction of your body and soul. Now, why should you fear hell? Why should you fear hell? Now, don't get me as one of these brim, fire and brimstone preachers. I, I teach Christianity as civilization, as culture, as values, as ideas, as beliefs. And I invite you to embrace them all fully and completely. But you should fear to insult the honor of God. If you believe that God is real, and I want you to answer this question. If God is real, do you believe that his honor and his dignity is of infinite value and worth? And if you agree that his honor and dignity is of infinite value and worth, should you insult it? Uh, on, just on time. I don't envisage the God of the Bible and other religions as being as personified as I think we do. Thank you. I think when uh, Moses went up onto the top of Mount Sinai and God said, I can't show you my full form, I think I can only show my back leg or something. Roughly, yeah? Confirm I'm right on that, he did. He you show you my back parts. Show you my back parts, thank you. I, I think there's a lot in that. I think that ultimately, our relationship to God is ultimately mystical, simply beyond our comprehension, yeah? So, um, I don't believe in a literally personified God, because whatever personified conception you have of God will be too limiting. God will be bigger than whatever I'm going to conceive. So, I'm mystical and maybe a big Buddhist in that sense. I think the Buddhists are quite on board with that, quite sensible. So, no, I don't accept that. I don't believe that God's honestly going to get insulted by how I handle his name. I think he, he can more than handle whatever God may be. I'm, I'm giving a wider berth to the concept of God, which may include exactly your view. It might be the right one. I'm not saying you're wrong. 
but it could be that there's a broader church, pardon me, of opinions in there. But to revert back to what you just said about me accepting Jesus, I, it's the conception of our models. I see Jesus as the vehicle. God would be the light towards which we head. Christianity would be a vehicle. I applaud Christianity as being an excellent vehicle to get you in that direction. I don't believe it's the only vehicle. Now, I'm not asking you to agree with that, but again, can you at least see the sincerity and a certain logic in that metaphor? Because if that's the way the world operates, then we can include more people of good character. Atheists, Muslims, etc. can be included as the equals that they were born to be and still be heading towards God and they can embrace their religion. I'm just... I'm, I'm really tired of watching Muslims and Christians come down here each week and slag each other off. The Muslims constantly going on about the Trinity, which I consider, you consider it very important. I think it's small fry arguments in terms of, I know, but in, I, I'll go to the Sermon on the Mount and stick to four texts. I, I'm sorry if I make you feel that way. And equally, you taking issues with the literalism. I think there's problems with both literal interpretations of the text. But, at heart, the five pillars of Islam have some merit, and I, I would be disingenuous to ignore that. I think it would be nice to see discussions happen where you can acknowledge the merit in certain other religions. And I think essentially it's about the way you live, living well. Religion gives... Sorry, I've kind of blown, I've only got 30 seconds left. I think the core question that all religions address is how should I live? For all people, for all time, and it always will be, yeah? It's the moral prescription as to how to live. And I think Christianity does an excellent job of addressing how to live, for the most part. I think other religions do that to some extent as well, and we should embrace them all as much as possible. If you live well, that's the journey as a pilgrim. If you don't happen to, in the pub quiz of life, have picked exactly the right religion, that's secondary, because the intellect is not a moral quality, yeah? It's how you live and the walk you walk, not the talk you talk. Time. Go. That's a brilliant conversation. Now. Thank you. Okay, so let, let's try and continue. Let's try and continue in the same spirit that has been established by the three minutes, three minutes. So allow me to make points, and then I allow you to reply. Do you want to? Do you want it time? Could you time it three minutes? Would you be? We would be all right to just. Thank you. Yeah. And just let us see your clock when you're ready. Thank you. Thank Thanks be to God. You've enriched me so much. Peace be with you, bro. My name is Gil. Thank you, Gil. Your name? Bob. Bob. Are you ready? So. The point is that you, 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 you've got to understand Christian spirituality. Within Christian spirituality, we see truth as a fire in the middle of a field. The closer you are to that fire, the more illuminated you are by that fire, the more warmed you are by that fire, the, the more brighter your face. Now, those that are, uh, uh, there are Christians who are very close to the fire. We call them saints. Yeah. We call them agios. We call them holy. We elevate them within our paradigm and say, these are examples to follow. Yeah. Saint Ignatius of Leola, Saint John Chrysostom, sure. Saint Hilda, and yeah. so on and so forth. But we believe that you can be so far away from the fire, on another field completely, let's call it Islam, that you can't even see the fire at all. And so you receive zero benefits from the fire. You can't even see it in the distance. And so it gives you zero benefit. Doesn't mean you're not on the same journey, but you're receiving no benefit because you're completely lost. Now, the, 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 the problem I would suggest to you is that your approach to spirituality is influenced by modern politics. It's not influenced by history, or genuine study of the religions, or a genuine understanding of the religions, sorry, not genuine study, genuine understanding. Because Islam and Christianity, for instance, are radically different. Christianity teaches that all human beings are made in the image of God and therefore have innate, unalterable dignity. Islam has no such concept, no such concept. And, and Christ makes claims that he is the light of the world, he is the way, the truth and the life, no one goes to the Father but through him. And that means that he's making unique claims about himself and his importance that you have to wrestle with. Now, you said that God is not personable, but in Colossians it states, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So it's saying that Christ is the image of God. And Christ himself says, I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So, you're claiming that you're searching for the God of the Bible, but the Bible is saying that God is personable, that God is knowable, and if he is personable and knowable, then that means that you have the ability to insult the honor of God. So when God, if I were to give you a gift, 
Say, I, like, bro, I want to give you a, a, a house, yeah. right? Something you could never afford and I want to give it to you, you know? If you reject this gift, it would be an insult to me. If you re and same as if you try to give a gift to someone, say you take someone some flowers as an apology yeah. and, and, and they reject those flowers, you're going to feel hurt, you're going to feel insulted. And God has offered you forgiveness for free, for nothing. And this gift is of such immeasurable worth that it is worth the world itself and everything in it. So if you reject it, you're insulting God's honor. So therefore, there has to be a punishment. Are we doing another three minutes? Yeah, we, we did. Oh, we got. I'm done. I'm done. You can reply. Yeah, three minutes. Give him three minutes. Um. Look, I like that I think we're moving closer towards common ground, roughly, yeah? This isn't turning into a shouty match, yeah. and, we seem, and that's what I want to do at Speaker's Corner, because I think a lot of people are bored with just the usual. Um, you say, for example, that Christ is, says he's the image of God. I'm buying into that. I could be wrong. It, it could be a much worse universe I've been born into that I'm hoping for, but I'm hoping for something where a Christian view and other religions are valid. It could be yeah. darker, yeah? So the stakes are high. Yeah. Just because Christ is the image of God, it doesn't follow necessarily that he's the only image of God. I think I might be able to see some reflections of godliness in the behaviour of Buddha in certain situations, yes? I could give examples, like when he threw himself off a cliff so that some animals could eat him because their mother had died and he sacrificed himself that way. The, the moral parallel seems fairly obvious. It seems to me he was responding to the fundamental equality of all life in some way in a compassionate fashion, yeah? That's a coherent analogy to draw. Um, I like that we're moving towards the same model. You use the idea of a fire in the middle of the field. I use the North Star or the North Pole. Essentially, it's the same image. In other words, it's no longer dualistic. You're no longer either standing in the light or the dark. You're just trying to aim towards the campfire in the middle, and you're moving further and further away from light, which is a monistic model to work with, and we can concur on it. Would we agree? You gave the model. I think it's the same as mine. Please, if we don't agree, I'll let you finish your points. My point would depend on your response to that. Okay, I, I don't believe that we're moving to a common ground. I believe you're just moving closer to Christ. Okay, that, that could be worse, let's put it that way. Okay, so we've got that. Um, I disagree with your notion that, using the fire analogy, that Muslims, such as Dawood, have moved so far into the darkness. And I've watched you discuss with Dawood. He's a good guy. I, I have a real problem with a god who's going to see him in a different light. I think Dawood is closer to that light than it may be comfortable for a literalist interpretation of that book to admit. But it's true, and the primary virtue of religions is that the truth should be followed. So I'm trying to hang with the truth on this, yeah? Um, I think you did what I think I've heard you do before, I'm not trying to cause a rut, which was typecast me as a modern snowflake who's been brainwashed by the media. I've been thinking this way for 40 years, okay? I've been thinking about this a long time, long before it became trendy, long before Jordan Peterson came along, I was thinking in Jordan Peterson terms. Long before Sam Harris came along, whose book I'm currently reading, I was also thinking in Sam Harris terms. Now, what's interesting to me is that you, me, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, Mohammed Hijab, Ali Duwa, we all have common ground in that we believe in, we, we aspire to fundamental human nature, a fundamental a fundamental morality that we do at the time. Time. Okay, ready we went through for... Can I, can I just have time yeah, to clear Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. Because it grounds up, I'm, we can spend a lot of time arguing differences and that's constructive, but if we can spend 50% of our time as well discussing similarities, and I think it's true to say that we hold a common view, a non-postmodern view, which I dislike, and you dislike, of morality and truth being just in the eye of the beholder. We are searching for the objective truth and the objective morality that you were discussing with Steve. And I'm totally on board for that, as is Sam Harris, an atheist. So in that we share that common ground, let's just admit it, because we can cross-fertilize our views constructively. Yeah? Thank you. Thank okay, you. three minutes. So my, 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 my point to you is that, again, your, your approach to theology has been influenced, to my eyes, by modern politics and the necessities of modern politics connected to mass migration and the need to create a society that's as frictionless as possible so that variant and different communities don't end up fighting one another as they did in Yugoslavia, Lebanon, Sudan, Nigeria um, and as they're do current, currently doing in Myanmar at the moment. 
Um, and so you're allowing that politics to influence your search for the truth. Christ said, the Christ that I'm calling you to follow, Christ said that I have come so that two might turn against five, that son might turn against father, that daughter might turn against mother. For anyone who chooses even their own family more than me is not worthy of me. Such is the high position that Christ gives himself in his own teaching. The exercise of spirituality is not just the exercise of finding moral common ground. And the reality is that when you, because I've, I've got a degree in religious studies, uh -huh. so I know Islam better than a lot of Muslims. Not all Muslims, but a lot of Muslims. And Christianity and Islam have fundamentally different approaches to humanity itself. Christianity believes and teaches in the equal dignity of all human beings. <laughs> Islam believes in the degradation of that dignity so that there are different people with different levels of dignity. Now you keep appealing to Dawood's goodness. Dawood believes in killing apostates, people who choose to leave Islam. Yes, he does. So then, then Dawood needs to have a conversation with Ali Dawa because apparently this witness is saying that he disagrees with... Yeah, exactly. So, so no, don't interrupt, don't interrupt. So I believe, and you'll have to prove me wrong, that Dawood believes in killing apostates. Ali Dawa believes in killing apostates, and he's... Are you listening? So, so Christianity and Islam don't teach the same thing. Human beings, one second. Some, some, oh bro, stop interrupting. Yeah, in terms of, in terms of, in terms of, in terms of, pause my time. I'm not trying to interrupt your time, just if you said, let's ask him. Dawood! Right, I'm not pausing. So, in terms of, in terms of, in terms of the religions, Human beings, I believe as a Christian, are all equal in dignity, regardless of their ethnicity, their background, their religion. And I believe that because I believe in the Amatio Deo, the image of God that all human beings are made in. Islam doesn't have that belief. Islam literally says in the Quran that a free Muslim is, sorry, a slave Muslim is better than a free Christian. So they don't believe in equal dignity and they don't practice it in their law either. So they, well, I'll just get a few more seconds because he interrupted. And so, so to claim that all religions are pointing in the same direction, I would suggest to you demonstrates that you don't know the religions enough to recognize that Christianity is pointing in one direction and Islam is pointing in a different direction. And it's not just their moral aspects that are different, which they fundamentally are, but it is their entirety of their worldview. And nothing brings this out more clearly than what they say about Jesus Christ, who is the North Star, the guy, the light of the world, the bread from heaven that gives eternal life that I'm calling you to. Okay, three minutes. Thank you. Um, you listed differences. I said before, I think if you spent 50% of the time discussing the obvious differences and 50% commonalities, it would be more constructive. Particularly after years of this at Speaker's Corner, even you must be a bit bored, yeah? I mean, this conversation is more constructive, I think. And maybe it's, it's, it's a bit of an improvement. It's, it's a break from the usual, at least, I hope. Because you're not heckling and shouting. I'm not heckling and shouting. I'm trying to gain some ground. Um, common ground, if possible, yeah? The differences are obvious. And my metaphor about cars travelling towards the truth was, I think you, I've misrepresented it or maybe misunderstood it. I'm saying all the cars are heading towards the truth, but their ability to undertake the journey is variable, yeah? Some got better brakes, some got better engine steering. Now, therefore, when I look at the vehicles, I'll look at Christianity, and I think it has the edge over Islam for many of the reasons that I've stated. But I don't think it means the vehicle of Islam has no merit. If it can make that journey, despite the problems of literalism I think it has, and other problems, then good for it. In other words, I think you could be a Muslim and complete the journey still, but it's probably going to be a bit more problematic. Yeah? With regard to, I'd love to check out who is behind us, but he's suddenly got a fan base. So, um, with regard to what Dawood believed, you mentioned that he would believe in apostasy. Killing apostates. Killing apostates. Killing Reading apostates. Book, he quotes that 36% of British Muslims believe that apostates should be killed. 
36. Okay. I sorry. I, 36. Up, sorry. So maybe I'm wrong on 36. I think it's 30 plus. 30 plus. Okay. I mean, Do you think we've got a problem in the UK, I, people? I would add to that, just because it's written in this book doesn't mean it's literally true. I just read it in a book. It's, it's backed up by, by lots I of research. I think Sam, Sam Harris is as sincere, so I'll trust him to some extent. Now, you can look at that and go, isn't this terrible? Isn't this appalling? And I did. And then I thought about it from the flip side and went, hang on a minute. That also means that over 60% of Muslims in this country don't believe don't in don't believe yes, absolutely. In the literal interpretation of the Quran. Correct. Now to me that's very hopeful when the, the hadith actually. Okay, in the hadith or the Quran, right. Now to me that's very hopeful. It means that the majority of active Muslims out there are there to be approached and discussed with. And I think the, the technique of the, what I'll call, more fundamentalist Christians certainly here, to simply concentrate on the, de the apparent deficits in Islam will further alienate the very people who could otherwise be courted in. And it's not so constructive. And it will be more Christian to at least share some time looking at the good stuff as well. well how are we doing? Uh, 2.38. So, yeah, I, I mean, if you, if you give me a tiny bit longer, I'd say, when I look at the differences between Christianity and Islam, I think Christianity is a bit more monistic. I think the idea that God is inherent instead of outside his creation makes far more sense. I take your point that I think, I may be wrong, Muslims see a stratified human nature, whereas Christians see equality. But I might be misrepresenting him and I favour the equality view. There are other areas where I'd say Islam may have a slight edge like its idea on an insolvent. I think intuitively they were more on point that maybe a human being isn't sacrosanct the second the sperm hits the egg, maybe it's a bit further down the timeline. I think they may be on point with that. And I think their eternal attack on the, the lack of moral logic of the um, original sin, I think it's, it makes sense, but original sin is a complex one, because I think original sin is a profound and important concept. How many more? Which I've nearly done, which both they Hey, they've misunderstood, and I think a lot of Christians have, but I'm going out on a limit. Okay, I'm done. So, so let me reply. Ready? So the, 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 you, you reduce religion and the practice of religion simply to a, a human thing. You, you, your idea is that Christianity, Islam and all the different religions, they're all cars that can get us to the, the destination we need to go, but some are better than others at doing that. Which means that you reduce religion simply to a construct of man. That is something that, that would unite the Muslims and the Christians in rejecting you and rejecting your opinion because both Muslims and Christians believe that the faith that they have received is a revelation from God. And that means that you, and, and here's my fundamental critique of your entire position, is that it is only your opinion. It is just your opinion. You, you are recasting the entire world according to what makes you feel good. You know, it makes me feel good to find commonalities and moralities, and so I find and exercise myself to find commonalities and realities. Please don't interrupt. Pause also, my time, please. I'm sorry, we're just going to have to wait until he finishes heckling because so he'll take your ten minutes. Of God and Jesus is also your opinion, and it's your opinion which designs what God, your idea of God, says and does. And you do that. That's how you come here, and that's why you judge other Christians as not being Christian enough. Because you think their interpretation and their oneness with God and their revelation was incorrect based on your personal opinion and judgment. There you go, ladies and Okay, gentlemen. right. Now I've finished. Uh, uh, are you doing done? That, right, are you ready? He's on YouTube pause, pause my time. Ready? Ready? You done? Good. Okay, so there, therefore, the, the exercise that you're undertaking is completely flawed. Oh, you're saying that you're saying that you're reducing the person, the historical person of Christ to simply your own construction of religion and more importantly, religious morality. But I'm saying that the truth is found in the historical person of Jesus, the one who says that you can go to hell for offending the mercy of God mm -hmm. and who says that your soul can be destroyed in hell. Now, if you believe that you have a soul, then you should take those words seriously if you take Jesus seriously. And that's all I'm inviting you to. I'm not inviting you to a particular church. I'm not even inviting you to a particular way of understanding the entirety of the Bible. I'm inviting you to take the historical person of Jesus seriously and his teaching seriously. And that means more than the Sermon on the Mount. It includes the Sermon on the Mount, but it's more than the Sermon on the Mount. Take everything that he says seriously, including those things that he says about himself. 
Now, furthermore, I'd like to point out that in terms of, um, you know, your, your ensoulment, I mean, this just contradicts science. The only definition of life that we can reasonably use is that life is the generation or the, the continuum of generation of cells is life. That is the definition of life. It's the only one that works biologically. It's the only one that can define life as, as uh, separate from the immaterial, i.e. that it generates life from its, it generates cell continu continuity. It also works well with the definition of death. So you can make the distinction because at death there is, I'm going to have a few more seconds, there is no extra uh, cell production, which means that life begins at conception. Which means that when Islam says that you can abort before ensoulment, in some schools' opinion, some schools say 120, some schools say 40, some schools say less than 40, which, and that, now that's really important. You've got this divine religion that's supposedly from God that can't even tell you where life begins, and that's really important to your concept of what constitutes murder. You know, with respect. so these are really different because they have moral consequences. I, I, I'm trying not to get into the branches, and I can that's a branch discussion to be had. Can I make one more point and then I'm done? Yeah, go ahead. You're, you're, you emphasize finding commonality, and I want to say that that is an exercise in futility because if you emphasize finding commonality, what you do is you emphasize the least important to ignore that which is most important. And that's a fundamental criticism of your entire spiritual exercise. Okay. I, I'm not, thank you. I'm three minutes. I'm not making... Three thirty, was it? Well... Let's I'm just, let's try to keep it to I'm three minutes to each. It, I'm definitely not making commonality be my number one priority, yeah? However, if commonality happens to arise as a result of me seeking objective truth in good faith, then I'm all the happier, okay? I'm definitely not some liberal snowflake, okay? I'm not in that camp. Um, you say I'm just believing what I want to believe. No, I prefer to believe in heaven and I was brought up, I'd love to believe there was an afterlife and I'd go to heaven. Despite the fact I know I'd like to believe it because I think truth is a virtue and I believe in self-consistency, I have to maybe have even let that concept go and understand that heaven may be metaphorical in the way that maybe hell is metaphorical, yeah? I shouldn't use that as an excuse for not following the fundamental precepts of, say, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, you say I should pick from the whole, look at the whole book. I agree, you can look at the whole book, but we have a hierarchy of values here. Now, hopefully you'll agree that the commandment not to murder is probably more important in that hierarchy than the commandment not to eat bacon. Or do you think they're of equal merit? No, they're not of equal merit. Thank you, okay. So yeah. we would agree that we have a hierarchy of values here, yeah. yes? And a sensible person looking for a self-consistent position will try and work out what that hierarchy is. And again and again, from Christianity and other religions, I get that a level of empathy and truth and equality rings true again and again. And for me, the beauty of Christianity, which is why I probably put it at the top of religions in a funny sort of way, is its simplicity and accessibility. It's not highly intellectual. You don't need a degree to understand it. It's about how you live. And the Sermon on the Mount seems to distill all the core beliefs from the Old Testament, 660 commandments or something in, I think, Exodus. The 10 plus a whole code or afterwards. It distills them all down to the core axiom. That's a major achievement. The common denominator in all of these rules, don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery. Not found in the Quran. Is, huh? None of the, those 10 commandments are not found in the Quran. No, those 10 may not be, but the kind of commandments you will get, I believe, in the Quran to some extent. I think that Islam is more flawed, but not totally flawed. Nonetheless, there are aspirations to the essential notion that you should treat other people the way you want to be treated. Because that speaks to the truth of our fundamental equality. The tragedy of the human condition is we're separated from each other, and I think I'm far more real than you, you or you. In reality, I'm not. If I step in your head, I'll be involved in probably just as an equal and important drama, emotionally, etc. We're both going to die, we didn't choose to get born, we want the same things, we fear the same things. Those are the fundamentals of the human condition I believe religion speaks to. Now, the reason also you're saying that it's just in my head. I know I sound like an atheist, but what I like about religion is it seems to sp understand the transcendent nature of human consciousness. In the mind, I either need to walk on this a bit or not. Can, or can. can we keep it to three minutes each? Okay, well, I, I was on the mind, brain mind dichotomy. Okay, well, come okay on. And, and I'm just thinking, can we start to round this, round, round this up? Whatever you like, the metaphor of beauty. So, yeah, one, yeah, one, one more round each. 
Yeah, so I'll speak, you speak, I'll speak, you speak, done. Can we include on the user flow dilemma to see if we can curl on it? Okay. I think we do. So, so my point to you is, ready? So my point to you is, yeah. do, do all religions have some good in them? Yes, because all people are made in the image of God. Nature itself is a reality, and all of these things point towards God, and therefore all religions will contain some goodness. But that it does not come from Muhammad. It doesn't come from the Quran. It doesn't come from the teachings of the religion. You applauded the so Ten Commandments. Good, Pause my time. <laughs> Make it clear. It's you need to listen. Yourself. You need. To, what did I say? What did he say? He said. I think Bob said that um, all religions have some good in them. There you go. You did say that. You weren't listening. Wait, you weren't listening. Very good news. I'm sorry, I'm sorry okay. to interrupt your conversation. Oh, well, but, but you're going to interrupt anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, it's Speaker's Corner. Let's not forget where we are, Bob the Destroyer. Okay, our conversation is breaking down. Our delusions. No, 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 it's there, there, these guys. Guys, guys. Yeah. Just, just, no one's your dimmy. Relax. Go and have a coffee. Yeah, so, he's so, okay, so, are we ready? Wait, 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 are you ready? Are you listening to me? Right, okay, so the, the point that I, I, I want to make to you is that you've got to make a choice, and this is the choice that I'm inviting you to, right? Who is Jesus to you personally? That's the question I want you to answer. Again, Forgetting, forgetting the, the religious structures, and I'm not against religious structures at all, the fundamental question that will conclude this spiritual journey for you is who do you say Jesus is? Because if you agree with Jesus' own claims, then I invite you to be his disciples. If you see Jesus, the Christ, as a great man, as a great moral teacher, be his disciple. If you believe that his moral teaching is great, then and you believe what he says about the importance of himself, then be his disciple. Because once you're his disciple, then you're a Christian. Until you're his disciple, there's no one foot in, one foot out with Jesus. He doesn't give you room. He says you're either for him or you're against him. You're either bringing in or you're scattering abroad. That is what Jesus says. So he in, he's saying that you have to choose him even above your family. Because when you find Jesus, you find that North Star that brings you to all virtue, that puts you on the right path to virtue, that puts you, and virtue is that school that brings about theosis, which is the, the image of God becoming clearer in you so that you become the light of God in the world, that God's light shines out from your person which is what you're aspiring to, I can tell. You're looking for that. Now, we have the same understanding of truth because it is a Christian understanding of truth. And I haven't moved. The common ground that you feel that we're discovering is you embracing more of a Christian worldview. Now, I object to Islam because of what Islam teaches, because it contradicts what the Bible teaches about the person of Jesus Christ. About the person of Jesus Christ. The, the Bible says that Jesus is God. The Quran says that Jesus isn't. That is fundamentally important. Absolutely important. Far more important than any moral questions. Uh, okay, Here's, that's where we disagree. I think okay. morality is the heart of the thing. This is about teleology. It's about the meaning of life. As I said before, the question every human being who is ever born will have to ask themselves is how should I live? Religion addresses that, not just religion. I love that you said there is good in all religions, and I understand you qualified that by going, but it's not because of what they say, but it's rare to hear that. I think you're very, very eloquent and well-read. I think you have courage. I think Hatun has courage. I think your intent is good and strong, and I respect that in people, whether or not they're totally on point. Morality is about good intent, and I think we come with good intent. I think it's a shame to see so many people of good intent simply attacking all the time, when obviously there are textual problems in both religions. Just a bit more concentration on commonalities as well, not because I'm a snowflake, but because it speaks to our common humanity, and I think religion addresses, as I was trying to say before, the fact that we have a transcendent nature, which atheists miss, consciousness itself, is miraculous. They're never going to understand what it is. 
It may be caused by the brain in neurology, but if neurology causes it, it means it isn't it. If you cause a thing, you're not that thing, yes? Which means consciousness has no mass and no energy, and yet it seems to definitely exist. It's the one thing I know for certain, and it's caused by something, therefore it isn't the thing that causes it. That opens up a whole arena where I wouldn't claim, as you would like me to, to go, I'm certain and I know. I'm very fluid on that question, but I recognise it as a core and important question that I think is in the DNA of religion and not atheism. Also in the DNA of religion is understanding that we're lumbered with a transcendent position here, which is paradoxical. We're programmed to live, but we're going to die. That makes it more complex. The kind of moral answers that we need in our lives have to understand the paradoxical and transcendent nature of the human condition. You won't just get that from an atheist platform. So uh, there's, there's more common ground to be had here, which is good. It's a win-win for everybody. If you want to close now, and I don't because I'm really enjoying it, but if you do, you do. I'm hoping we at least agree on the Euthyphro dilemma. It seems we do, which is that God commands it because it's good, not it's good because God commands it. We're on the same platform there, yeah? Um, I'm happy to cut short if you want to answer. I may have had one more point. Um, you asked what I thought about if you do the Euthyphro dilemma. You asked what I see in Christ. I see in Christ an exemplary moral paradigm, maybe the best. Yeah, so all credit there, and I think an exemplary moral paradigm because he understands the transcendent and conflicted paradoxes of the human condition, and he walks the walk. So all credit. You don't prefer with you don't. Good, yeah. Okay. Blow, blow, blow it. It's just a wasp. It won't kill you. <laughs> yeah, but it'll sting, and that's irritating and hurts. If you blow them. If you waft your hand, they get angry. If you just blow them, they just think it's wind and they go away. And also they get aroused. Yeah. So, okay. Win -win. So, in terms of... Are we ready? Okay. So, you, you have... I want to start where you finished. Jesus is the, 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 the perfect moral paradigm. Well, be his disciple then. That's what I'm inviting you to. You know what I mean, I'm not calling you to anything against what you've already concluded. I'm just asking you to take Jesus as seriously as you already have in terms of his moral teaching. Well, take what he says about him seriously. Take what the Bible says about him seriously, that he is the image of the invisible God. Right, then be his disciple. But I'm saying to you that and if you take him seriously, then you, he will teach you the Trinity. He will teach you that the, the, he has founded a new covenant community, the Catholic Church. He will teach you the importance of the sacraments. He will teach you the uniqueness of his own person. If you're a disciple of Jesus, take all of what he said as seriously as his moral teaching and his moral example. Now, you've asked me, and I'm, I'm going to give you the courtesy of a, a full reply, about the, the dilemma. The yeah, the Euthyphro dilemma. God is good. The Bible says that. So that means that what he commands is good because of his nature. It isn't that there is some goodness outside of God that God is appealing to, to say, because it's good, now I command it. He commands directions. Your understanding that all religions are moving in the same direction is influenced by politics, not by good understanding of Christianity or Islam. Christianity teaches that God is love. Islam teaches that God is power, will. And that's why the highest value in the Islamic moral system is dominion and the idea of the caliphate and the idea of submission to the Sharia. In the Christian worldview, the highest value is that we express our nature through love, faith and hope. Now, you already know that virtue is the thing, the path that leads us to God, theosis. You've already, I can see you already get that. What I'm saying to you is that the value that we ascribe to each of these virtues is dictated by the narrative that we have. So the narrative of Jesus orders the virtues correctly so that some virtues are higher than others. Some virtues are more important than others. Chastity is important, but it's not as important as love. Hope is important, but it's not as important as love. Faith is important, but it's not as important as love. In Islam, that the, in Islam, in Islam, they have the same mechanism, but at the top of the tree is submission is the highest virtue, which means above that is dominance, dominion, the dominion of Allah. These are very different gods, very different religions, very different value paradigms. 
They aren't going in the same direction. They don't take you to the same place. And my, my final word, my final word, and I'll give you the last word and then we're done. My final word is simply, I encourage you to take Jesus even more seriously than you do. That's it, that's all I'm asking you to do. You know, if you can commit to that, I don't think you would find it abhorrent. I don't think it would contradict your own soul. I don't think it would contradict your own conscience. So I'm only inviting you to do something that I think you're predisposed to do anyway. I'm just encouraging you to do it really in seriousness. I get it. I get it. And that's my final word. Thank you. That, you, was, very, that was very eloquent. Um, I don't want to ditch Daoud. He's a good guy. I'm not saying he's. I'm not saying that he's a, a, a not. No, a bad. I don't. He is. He just is. My okay. attack is against Mohammed, not Daoud. You know, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one soul, and there's one soul over there, and he's a good guy. Anyway. I but no, that comes to repentance, that verse, that comes to repentance. Yeah, when it comes to, well, I, I, I don't see religion as a pub quiz, it's not intellectual. And that, I was going to say, is the beauty of Christianity to me, is that it's not intellectual in its simplicity. I really value it in that sense. I think it's something anybody can embrace. It's a common man religion. It doesn't get lost in the intellectual headspace, which is why I don't want to get too involved in even the Trinity or transubstantiation and the small print. If you get the core message and you respect the guy's journey and you see it in his life, then you've got the central bit and don't spend too much time on the branches, I think. I take your point about problematic elements in Islam and that they overstate power. But I sense also in their religion, if I'm being charitable, that underneath that veneer and that hard the outer shell of it, there are more kind of Christian principles coming through. They also speak of love and justice. But I'd like to close by saying thank you very much for the conversation. I think it's been constructive. I like your solution to the youth flow dilemma. I think we'd agree that God says it because it's good, um, because he is inherently good. Um, and I like that you recognise there's some good in other religions. And I like that you gave me the time and the space to not just do what seems to happen so often. That's the main thing. So thank you. Well, we did that because you're capable of having a conversation. I, I shout when I have to because people just interrupt continuously or shout, and so I have to shout. My, 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 my thing to you is to, to pick up your New Testament, to read the four Gospels, and, and take seriously not just the Sermon of the Mount, but everything else that's said about Jesus in those books. Yeah, do that. And then come back and let's talk some more. Yeah, let's talk some more. You know, and, and I, would, I, I would point out to you that one of the principal things that you raised was this idea of, of eternal damnation and burning in hell. And I don't, I, though I accept that my view is a minority opinion, not the classical opinion, yeah. um, but I believe that Christ teaches that it's not that you burn eternally in hell. Well, good. I think that's also a good thing from this. I hadn't understood that before, and I think that's a minority. You've got to understand, my, that, uh, that's a minority position. Well, I don't believe reality is a yeah. popularity contest. But, but, but I would say to you, again, I would say to you, that be willing to see the differences for what they are. But they are. There are definite differences, no yeah. question. And, and if you accept that Christ... Well, I hope they're reconcilable at a deeper root level. The, the, I would suggest to you that they're not. Okay. But let's, Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure. Chat. I would like to give you a gift. It was a good chat, and I always give a gift to someone who's, who's given me a gift. I want to show you what following Jesus inspires people to do. Well, so, accept your gift in good faith. Thank yeah. you very much. So this is about Christians who went into some of the roughest estates. I forget in which country. I think it's in the UK. Yeah. They went into some of the roughest, most deprived most socially um, de deprived areas yeah. and they went and lived out the, the gospel life amongst the poor and, and all the projects that they did to elevate people's living conditions, elevate people's so souls. So there you go. Area. No, no, they're not. not. No, no, they're not. No, they're not. Charity rich kids. Let me, let me See, this is, this is where his communism gets in. Actually, we get on as well. You'd be amazed who you can get on with him. Yeah, but he, do you, you think, think I could get on with this kind of attitude? Do you, you attitude? do you see why I have to shout? Do you see why I have to shout? Do you see why I have to shout? Your conversation's over now. Yeah, do you see why I have to shout? Anyway, all right, God bless you. God bless you. There we go. Can't people come yeah, let, let's do a wrap-up. Fatally flawed intellectually. That's so, why you have to do that. Be nice. Dusty's demonstrating why you shouldn't be an atheist or a communist. I'm not an atheist or a communist. So, this poor Bob oh. Destroyer so, cannot understand so, some basic what, what, what are you? What are you, Dusty? All right.
right, good. He's actually asking a fucking question, ladies and gentlemen. Why you dust? Why you dust? First one. Very good, Bob. Why you dust? You are definitely capable of learning. Other than patronising, what are you? Oh, you're not. Go on, I just learned from you, mate, on, so you can chill out. Okay, dust doesn't want to talk, so let's go and talk somewhere else. They're going to edit you. Okay, Bob Sila. So, there, Bob so, social manners, Dust. We're going to do a wrap up, then we'll talk. So, what so am I? social manners. I'm a man okay, that let's walk away again from that's, Dust. That's what I am. Don't Let, let's just demonstrate. Let's just demonstrate that don't that run. Dust doesn't have the ability to have a conversation. Why, Bob? He doesn't have the ability to have a conversation. Why, Bob? I don't know. Because I thought he was a communist and an atheist, but apparently it's not. So whatever he is, it's failed him. Uh, yeah. So Talking no, about reality no. means so, you failed. So well right. Done. If you so your Bob, it's Dust, wrong. you're ill, bro. Then, you're ill. Then reality is Dust, you're ill. Fine. You're ill, Dust. All right. What you say? You're ill, Dust. Ago? Oh yeah, because I, cause that's right. You're, you're ill, go. Dust. If you disagree with Bob the Destroyer, dust, you're Ill. that makes you ill. That's you're, you're what, unstable. Head, you're, you're unstable, this is correct. Dust. You're head, unstable. You are ill. You I'm also have an unhealthy fixation with me. If you disagree, if you, disagree you have an unhealthy fixation with me. Unhealthy, because I like to you have an un, debate You have an unhealthy you. fixation with me, Dust. reality and confusion <laughs> of. You have an unhealthy fixation I with me, Dust. I know you need to abuse, just like. You're ill. You're ill, Dust. Does Jesus abuse? Dill, you Let out there, ladies and gentlemen. Does Jesus abuse as well? Vipers and whitewashed mean? tombs. Yeah, that's right. Because that's Jesus, what he said about Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus is famous. That's for what he said about people. the scribes. Is that what Jesus is famous for? That's, that's what Jesus. Or is that your interpretation of Jesus? Dust. Abusing you're people. Ill dust. That's his Jesus Dale, you're interpretation. Dust. You're ill. Oh, this is interpretation of Jesus. Dust. You're ill. Is to abuse You have an unhealthy people. fixation on me. That's why he I has to I hope you abuse. get better. I really do. That's why I he has to patch I hope you get well. That's why he has to run away. Let's move away. Because Jesus doesn't abuse, does he? So Only you abuse. Dust, you're ill. Only you're ill, Jesus dust. doesn't abuse. Dale, Only you dust, abuse. You're Ill. So that means you're not You've Jesus. You've got an unhealthy fixation. Or anything of understanding of Jesus. I in feel sorry fact. for you. You have does my he sympathy. Have to abuse? You have does my Jesus sympathy. Jesus abuse in the Bible. Does he go around people dust, with a microphone abusing you're people? Ill, dust. Is that what Jesus does? Going around, being dust, abusive, being bothered to destroy her, abusing you're people, Ill. being aggressive and angry. This is speaker's Who's aggressive corner. aggressive and angry? He's a bit confused. He's a bit, he's a bit triggered, isn't he? Oh, he's, he's a bit triggered. Is that what Dust, Jesus Dust is a bit triggered. He's a bit triggered, this guy. Is that Jesus doing that? Dust, we're moving towards a cafe. We're not yeah, in speaker's we're corner We're doing anymore. it tomorrow. And why should Dust, we stop? Dust, because we should engage Dust, in debate. There's no Bob debating you. Here. It's not possible to debate you. When you're I incapable talk, of having a conversation. He just descends to abuse. Dust, you're incapable is that what Jesus of having does? a conversation. Can you show me in the Bible? Because you know the Bible, don't you? You dust, know the Bible. Dust, you're where emotionally in the Bible, unstable. Where in the Bible does it, where, where does it say being abusive? Where does it say Stop walking into me. Stop walking into me. Where does it say that dust, Jesus stop in the Bible? Can you, say, you know the Bible. So, well, you've read it. You went and had a degree. Dust, you're ill. He was showing off dust. about his degree a moment you're, you're, you're about. You're in a cafe, in Dust. You're in a cafe, Dust. So, your degree in religion. Dust. Where does you're Jesus You're in a cafe. Nobody wants to hear this, Dust. Where is Jesus abusing in religion? There's no point talking to you. Can you show me that? You're a smart man, Bob the Destroyer. You're ill, Dust. Smart man. Dust, you're ill. Show me where abuse in the Dust unfortunately Jesus is like emotionally unstable and this oh, is why he can't have a conversation. Quoting the, quoting the Bible. You can tell by his behavior, his erratic and irrational behavior, that, he, and that he's, I can't say any, I can't say anything about his clothing. I've got no sense of fashion myself. But, but notice, notice he's shouting even when we're talking. He's shouting even when we're talking. In the Bible. Because he's emotionally unstable. Why does it say in the Bible? This is why you can't have a conversation with Bill. This is why you can't have a conversation with Dust. Suddenly, anyway, we might as well stop. Turn the camera off and he'll go away. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dust. never exist. Thank you, that's really lovely to meet you. Okay, let's do it over here. Yeah. So, as you as you can see, as you can see, when you turn the camera off, dust walks away because he has an unhealthy fixation. And now we've got now we've got the camera on. He's come running back. So we'll just turn it off. Turn it off. Turn it off. Don't be frightened of the dust. Don't be frightened of me. Don't do that. Don't be scared a little on me. No one's scared of Oh yeah, you're running away, Bob. Clearly reality is something that confuses you. Clearly reality confuses you. Remember where you are. Because you're ill, Dust. We love you, Dust. We love you, Dust. It's on, it's on, it's on. Is the camera back on? Is it giving... Right.
What time? I think it's about four o'clock. Let him go away first. He's gone, he's gone now. He's done with that. Alright. Waiting for you to turn the camera back. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a vulture around me. It's like a fly around <laughs> shit. Speak behind people's backs oh, as well. Is that what Jesus does? Oh, Bob, you know that in the Bible. Speaking about his back. It's amazing how your idea of Jesus is really pathetic. Is it no. Your idea of Jesus. Why, cut.